the globalist threat is the greatest threat to humanity ever. It's not just happening in Germany or in Spain or in some element of America or Africa. Their ambition is global. When you really bore down into what globalism is, they're against humanity. They want transhumanism. They want people to be chipped, implanted, to become something other than what it is to be human. We are seeing these individuals acting in unison, in lockstep, all over the Western world, and they are slowly gathering the reins of power of the corporate world, governments, UN, EU, NATO, so that they can weaponize all of these institutions against free peoples globally. So they do represent, in my view, the greatest threat to humanity in the history of civilization. Welcome into another episode of Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton, and it is my pleasure to have with me my good friend, my uh, this, the Highlander himself, Jim Ferguson, reporting to us from the Scottish Highlands. Jim, how are you, buddy? I'm really good. Uh, thanks, Larry. It's fantastic to be here. The weather's a little bit wild outside, I've got to say, so I apologize if you're hearing any sort of clanking or clunking. It's blowing an absolute gale here. But yeah, I'm good. Great to be with you. Well, um, Jim, I always enjoy reading your social media posts. I haven't had much opportunity to do it the last few weeks because I've been traveling um, so much. But when I do get the opportunity to kind of catch up, uh, you are just a, you know, uh, a whirlwind on social media. I mean, you, you are, uh, um, you really have your ear to the ground of what's going on in the EU in particular, uh, globally, but with the EU in particular, uh, tell me what really has your attention right now. Well, there's massive, uh, there's massive uh, focus on the EU and, the, of course, the unelected EU Commission, which is never elected by anybody. They're just appointed. They, they appoint their friends into it. And they, of course, take, uh, take uh, authority over the parliamentarians, the lawmakers in the EU Parliament. They cannot actually pass any laws unless the EU Commission agree to it. It's the only parliament in the world that is uh, really uh, very undemocratic. But uh, one of the things that I'm focusing in on right now is what's going on in Italy and France and the Netherlands, because I've just come back from Holland. I was over there meeting with a lot of Dutch farmers and, and their uh, freedom fighters, not just from Holland, but they were there from America, Canada, Australia, the UK, and indeed all over Holland. Um, I was at a packed assembly, hundreds. They couldn't have got any more people in there. And the talk is of leaving the EU. There's a lot of people that are saying the EU is no longer fit for a purpose. And of course, all these countries, as you'll know yourself in the United States of America, the southern border, are being flooded with illegal migrants. It's a massive problem. Jim, do you think that there's any real um, chance for that, for the dissolution of the EU? Yes, I mean, we're starting to see, I mean, Germany, when, when, when uh, the, the UK was in, Germany and the, the UK had sort of comparable statistics in terms of economic trade and wealth and influence and the amount of money that was going in. Since uh, technically, uh, and I say technically, the UK has left because we haven't really fully left yet. Uh, and I can come on to explain a bit more about that to your, to your audience in a moment. But since they, they, they have left, Germany um, has been the powerhouse, the economic powerhouse within Europe. But Germany is in recession right now, and uh, they have got massive, massive problems. Uh, they're nosediving in terms of economic performance. And if they didn't have Germany, I think the EU would probably collapse because these other nations could never uh, give to keep this project alive. Germany's the only one that's keeping it going. There's a common sense reason gold is pushing to an all-time high right now. Actually, there are several reasons. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed since January 21. Cost of living is up 17.9%. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now above $34 trillion, causing many to wonder when this house of cards is going to come crashing down. 
and a presidential election this year that will have massive implications for the future of the country. All of this adds up to instability and uncertainty, and that is why so many Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? Secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold. Text IDEAS to 989898 and get your free info kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. With an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and tens of thousands of happy customers, you can count on Birch Gold 2. Just text IDEAS to 989898 to claim your free info kit to protect your savings from uncertainty today. Yeah, I mean, Germany has been the economic powerhouse and has been funding, particularly those countries in Southern Europe, uh, constantly uh, bailing out, say, Greece, uh, for instance, uh, Italy, in order to maintain their membership in the EU and try to keep some measure of peace. But I mean, if they're in a serious economic uh, recession, that's going to be much harder to do. Well, it is. And of course, they're sinking so much money, um, unbelievable amounts of money into Ukraine, into the war effort there, uh, billions and billions of euros. Even Viktor Orban, who is the, the leader of Hungary, has said, you know, enough's enough. We, we're just not going to continue to do this. It's like an endless amount of money that's going in. And of course, a lot of the people in these respective countries are really feeling the economic pinch. I was speaking to a lot of people in Holland just within the last few days who were saying, there are people there struggling to pay the bills. They can't afford to pay the mortgages. Inflation's rising. Food costs are going off the charts. And yet they're still pouring billions into Ukraine to a pointless war that, frankly, none of the people I speak to uh, support. What do you think of Orban? What's your opinion? Viktor Orban is probably um, in the same kind of league as Donald Trump, uh, Nigel Farage, Marine Le Pen, I mean, they're all different and they're obviously different nationalities. But Hungary, Hungary has a leader that puts his people first. And that's why he has so much respect around the world from people who are true patriots that love their own respective countries. Because we admire and we appreciate national leaders that put their countries first instead of these unhinged globalists that we see in the World Economic Forum and others that you so eloquently report on from time to time. And uh, Viktor Orban is most definitely a powerful leader. Yeah, he is. I have um, greatly admired him from afar. Um, I've heard him speak on a couple of occasions. I, not, I wasn't physically present, but I mean, just listening to him online. And um, wow, um, what an impressive guy and how he has spoken very strongly in terms of not only uh, his own national values, but Christian values. He's a um, he's really an extraordinary figure. Well, he he is, and he is very passionate about keeping Hungary uh, for the the Hungarians and to ensure that the, the the religion of Hungary, which is Christian, is maintained. And he knows that flooding any country with massive amounts of illegal migrants, especially from parts of the world who have no empathy with that national identity, culture, or religion, will end up causing massive problems, as we've seen in France, as we've seen in Germany, as we've seen in Ireland. You know, Larry, I was across in Ireland uh, about five, six weeks ago. Uh, I was in Southern Ireland. I went on a march. There was about 10,000 patriots in the crowd that I addressed. I was very, very pleased to be given the opportunity to speak there. And uh, I was with political leaders uh, of um, the Irish Freedom Party and other parties who are passionate about their country. But what's going on in Ireland with mass illegal immigration is frightening, truly frightening. There are entire communities being decimated. Communities of maybe, you know, 800, 900 people suddenly finding that the local hotel or the local number of hotels around the area are being flooded with migrants. And there's maybe eight, nine, ten, you know, a thousand uh, migrants going in to those communities. And it's completely destroying the fabric of those communities. The rapes, the assaults, the attacks on women and children are on a daily basis now. Uh, we've seen Leo Varadkar, the Chief Taoiseach, or the, the, the Premier of Ireland now, uh, preparing to resign. 
Some suspect that he might have been involved in a scandal. He's denied it. He said it's all conspiracy theories. Well, we shall wait and see. But the UK is no stranger to mass scale immigration as well. I believe the globalists are using it very successfully to destroy and weaken nations from within. And we've seen that, of course, at the US southern border as well, Larry. It's really quite appalling what's going on there. Let's tell a little bit of your own personal story. I'm frequently asked by, from people, uh, by people, what can I do? I mean, what can I do? How can I get involved? Uh, you're, you're a guy who had, you know, 10 years ago, you weren't doing this. You had your own business interests. You were um, engaged politically, always very thoughtful about your own country and the things that are taking place there. But suddenly something kind of provoked you and you decided you were going to get a lot more involved. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I had been approached by a member of parliament in the Scottish parliament, an MSP there, uh, who was a, a real uh, experienced lady. She was uh, she's very well known within the party. And she, she approached me and said, look, we'd, we'd really like you to get involved. And I, of course, in, in a, wearing another hat, I was heavily involved with law enforcement, not as, a, not as a police officer, but as something else. I worked with very specialized policing units and intelligence and people that were involved in counterterrorism and all sorts of good things like that. But I, I got involved with the Conservative Party. I became a political candidate. I stood as the candidate. I competed against other people who were coming in, and I won. Uh, and I stood in the, uh, the general election of uh, 2010 when David Cameron was fighting to become prime minister, and of course he did. Now, um, I, 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 I guess I, I, I wasn't happy because they, they took a very sort of um, amenable pro approach to the European Union. And once again, as we started off by, by talking about the European Commission, they are completely undemocratic. Um, and I didn't like the fact that they were dictating to the United Kingdom all the different laws to do with immigration, to do with uh, pretty, pretty much anything that they could think of. So I left the Conservative Party feeling pretty disillusioned with them. Uh, they wanted me to stay. They wanted me to continue to do it. And I said, no, I'm, I've, I'm, I've got, I, I don't see the point in, in, in campaigning with a party that doesn't have the same values and belief systems as me. So a few years went on. And then in 2019, I saw Nigel Farage appearing on a news conference. He was talking about the Brexit party and that he was going to launch it at the Steelworks in Coventry. So to cut a long story short, I went down there to see what it was all about. I ended up being on stage with Nigel uh, by accident. I was told to step on stage. I think I found out later, Larry, it was to do with making sure there's people around him as he came out in front of all the, the television cameras. But um, to this day, if you, look, if, you, if you look up Nigel Farage, Steelworks, Coventry, launch of the Brexit party, about three to the right, you'll see a very puzzled looking Jim Ferguson sitting there wondering what it was all about. But I got recruited into the party very, very deeply. And um, I stood within the European Parliament, Westminster, but I, I was recruited much, much further into it because I ended up working at London HQ and traveling all over the country. And I was recruiting and vetting and making sure that the prospective parliamentary candidates that were coming in to stand in those different seats were suitable. Uh, and, and, and I was tasked with giving them some pretty tough interviews, which I did do. But I was very proud that many of the, the most excellent candidates that I chose uh, went on to do really very well within the party. So I guess uh, what, what triggered me uh, in particular was at the end of that general election, three years forward, um, I hadn't been on much on social media. I was increasingly seeing the EU exerting more control, despite the fact that we had, you know, supposedly got Brexit done, but we hadn't really. And um, that's what provoked me to come back into it. But I was also very well aware of all the tyranny that had gone on, and I don't use that word lightly, the, the lockdowns, the, the vaccine mandates, all of these types of things, which um, by this time I had been quite clear was a, was a bit of a fraud. Uh, when you see elected leaders slapping each other in the back when their cameras are not on them, yet when the camera's on, they're all putting their masks on, they're all having their social distancing, and then all the, 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 the really quite disgusting uh, antics of people in our own parliament and government who were caught having parties when there was everybody else was being locked down. It became clear to me it was just a fraud. And um, I decided to go back onto social media. I hadn't been on for about three years. I had about 1,800 followers, I think, from a channel that had at its height about 2,400, because I'd only 
I only started in May 2019, and then at the general election, I pretty much stopped. So it's six months' worth of tweets. Uh, but I was surprised to find there was still 1,800 people there. And to my surprise, and I, I really do mean this, Larry, it, it, I never set out to do any of the stuff I'm now doing or finding myself involved in. Uh, the channel has grown enormously and very quickly. And these are real people. Uh, you know, you don't get the kind of levels of views and retweets with a fake account. These are real people that are following me. And as I flew into Holland on Saturday, one of the tweets that I put out, because, you know, when you're up in the plane, you, you, you can't, you don't have access to it. But as you came in, you know, you, you can put your phone back on as you land. And I saw that one of the tweets was, was sitting at about 625,000 views that I'd only put out about six hours before. The hotel that I was going to was in Zwolle, and it was about an hour's drive. And as the driver was taking me up there, uh, once, I, once I got to the hotel, it had gone up to 825,000 views. And when we went to dinner that night, it had gone over a million. So it, it, it's not unusual for me to get viral tweets. Um, and I think perhaps sometimes, well, I, I found out by accident that there's a lot of people that follow me that have very, very big channels. And they're really quite famous in their own right. People very close to Donald Trump, like General Flynn, for example. People like Lara Logan, top journalist, very, very capable lady, follows me, Kim.com. James Woods, the actor, he's got about 3 million followers. He follows me. I don't know why they did, uh, but they do. And sometimes they retweet out the, the posts that I make. So it, it provoked me into taking action. There was a lot of people doing a lot of things or saying a lot of things, but not much was happening. And then about um, 14 months ago, Larry, um, as you know, I started to, to reach out to people on Zoom, to people that I, I knew in Canada and America, and I started to engage and started to build networks uh, within those countries and um, decided that I was going to launch a freedom movement called Freedom Trade International, which was modeled a little bit on the Tea Party movement in the United States. And here we are. Uh, we only launched at the end of January. We have multiple thousands of members already. And I'm very proud and pleased with the fact that you're involved with that now as well. So I've got some great people around me. We've got a fantastic core team. Where does it go from here? Larry, I don't honestly know. But the whole purpose of it is because I'm passionate about freedom and freedom of movement and freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And, uh, you know, the United States of America is a truly great country. Uh, one of the few in the world that's protected, if not the only one, with a constitution and a code of laws that is sacrosanct. Yet I see that being undermined at every opportunity by far leftists like Joe Biden and his administration. But you've got to fight to protect what you, you value the most. And what we're doing is in creating an international community all around the world. We now have members in France, <coughs> Germany, Holland, Ireland, the UK, obviously the United States of America and Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And it's all about trying to give people some, to make some sense of what's going on. But as the censorship laws come in, as the disinformation and the misinformation laws are enacted by proxy World Economic Forum puppets and governments in our respective countries, I believe it's very, very important that we continue to keep that communication going. And our members very soon now are going to be getting very detailed information and analysis to do with what's really going on and what's probably coming down the pipe. So that's kind of where I am. I never really set out to do any of this, but uh, here we are. Well, um, you're very familiar with this statement that uh, the maxim that all it takes for, I think attributed to Lord Acton, that all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And, um, you know, I often refer to the World Economic Forum as the HOA from hell, the Homeowners Association from hell. And, and, and I do because there is this very odd sociological phenomenon that within any organization to which I've ever belonged, whether it's the faculty, you know, of a, some sort of institution or it is a, a homeowners, literal homeowners association, a political party, what have you, a business, it seems that the leftists within that organization, who usually are a minority, somehow end up in charge. And my theory is that I think it's the natural disposition of a conservative mindset to sort of live and let live, that I don't have any real interest 
in running your homeowners association, our homeowners association, let the Fergusons do whatever they want to do, you know, over there. And, uh, they leave us alone and we live and let live and we're friendly to, to one another, but that's not the way they think. They think in terms of control. They can't stand the thought that you might be putting the plastic in the paper bin and the paper in the plastic bin, that your grass might be too high, that you you might actually be free. You might actually be doing something that they don't like. They can't, they can't tolerate the thought of that. And so they gravitate towards the levers of power. And to me, this is what we're seeing taking place all over chiefly, not exclusively, but chiefly the Western world. And if there's anything that I've learned from my travels, and I think you from your own, because as you've just indicated in this interview, you've, you've done quite a lot. You've just been on the continent. You were, you were in uh, Ireland. You were, you were here sitting right next to me uh, in uh, this studio in Alabama where we ate barbecue and we went and uh, went to a machine gun um, park, <laughs> which was which was so much fun, so much oh, yeah. fun, and uh, and spent out a lot of uh, a brass. But something that people who are listening to us might not really understand is they might think the phenomena that they are observing is localized. That it's very localized. That it's you know it's just happening in the United States. It's Joe Biden and his people, or it's um you know it's just Sunak, or it's just Trudeau, and that's not the case because we are seeing these individuals acting in unison in lockstep all over the Western world, and it is elitists against populists, and by populists I just mean common people. Just common people. Now, in the in the left's mouth, populism is to be equated with fascism and Nazism, but that's not what populism is. Populism is just it can be it's 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 morally neutral. It might be good or it might be bad, um, but in this case, it's good. It's just the common people, people like you, people like me, who are linking arms across the Western world and saying we must unite against yeah. this present darkness because these are people who are intent on, and they're highly organized on destroying mm. our freedom. Well, that's one of the things that uh, I've really enjoyed about, you know, when I got to know you, Larry, because I had been doing some research, as you know, uh, a good number of months ago, now, probably nine, nine, 10 months ago, I'm sure it's been. And uh, I came across, quite by chance, one of your podcasts on this very channel on the World Economic Forum. And it blew me away. I mean, it, it, I, I, I learned, it, it was not so much the, the, the content, it was the way you explained it. You were very thoughtful, you were very factual, and you have a very eloquent way at presenting your shows. So, you know, in, in answer to you, I would say what you're describing is an incredibly accurate assessment of what's actually going on. When you explain the kind of philosophies of the, the far left, these types of people who cannot let other people live in peace, you're absolutely spot on. That's exactly it. Most conservatives are quite happy to live and let live. They don't really mind what you do as long as you're not really interfering with them or their family or their business. But the left are very different. They don't want you to have freedom of choice. They don't want you to have freedom of speech. And if you dare to disagree with them, you will be uh, under an attack, a, a tirade of abuse like you wouldn't believe. And I mean, in my campaigning Bre in, in, the, in the, the Brexit party on, on the streets, we would see far leftists coming up to us and they were always brutal. They were always hostile. There was no give or take with them. And that just fits into your very accurate assessment of how they operate and how they think. And I think what we need to do as conservatives, and I use that word loosely because, I mean, I'm not a member of any political party at, the, at this present point, but I do believe in traditional values uh, of typical conservative policies, good health care, freedom, uh, supporting the Constitution, uh, strong defence, peace through strength. You know, these types of things are important to, to people like us. But I think what we're going to have to do is realise that our way of life is under attack. And the globalists 
like Soros, like Bill Gates, like the Clintons, like those people that are uh, funding these NGOs, these district attorneys in America, that are destroying your country from within. They've got to be held to account, and they've got to be held to account very quickly. Because if they continue to go unchallenged, uh, Larry, uh, I, I believe we could be witnessing some very, very serious consequences as a result. And I just hope, you know, for America's sake and the people that I love in America, that Donald Trump is re-elected as president. But I fear they're going to try and do everything they can, every dirty trick uh, that's, that's pulled out against them. I believe they will employ it. And uh, we've got to be vigilant and uh, take great care and stand up around the world together because we face a globalist threat and no one group or no one country, even a mighty nation like the United States, can withstand against the entire world. So we, within the, the patriotic movements, those of us that love our countries, must come together. Whether that's through Freedom Train International or some other mechanism, we've got to come together and we've got to unite and pull our resources. Jim, you love your country, don't you? You love Scotland. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm a Scottish Highlander with a little bit of Viking thrown in. Uh, I go back a long way. But I love Britain. You know, I'm very proud to be a, a British Scot. And uh, I love the Irish people, the Welsh people, and the English people. We're, we're, we've achieved a lot together over the, the many, many years that we've, we've shared these islands. So, yes, I'm very, very proud of my country. Not a thing in the world wrong with that. I uh, respect you for it. I was recently in Egypt, as you know, and I was just chatting with my driver and who himself was an Egyptian. And he was talking, he was just asking me questions about the United States and our politics. And I found myself kind of looking out the window and pondering one of his questions. And I said, almost as a throwaway comment, I said, I love my country. And a couple of minutes went by, and I, he obviously had been processing that remark. And he said, I love mine. And I said, I respect you for that. I said, you should. You should love your country. It doesn't mean that we love the evil things that our countries have done or are, in fact, perhaps doing. In the case of the United States, abortion, open borders, um, the, the awful things that are being done to children, uh, in my country. I don't love those things, but, but there are things about my country that I love and I fight for. The, the, the beautiful words of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that, that all men are created uh, equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, those are words that resonate with many a human soul well beyond the boundaries of the United States, that we are a people who love freedom. And, um, and Jim, I, I find that it's, to say that it's evil what we're seeing almost doesn't quite capture what's happening. It is an endeavor uh, uh, to absolutely crush common people uh, their household economies, their national economies, uh, their love of country, um, their religious freedom of religious expression, um, their individuality, all of it to be crushed. And it seems to me that the only hope we have uh, is that with the aid of God Almighty himself, that we have to, as a people, as the globalists themselves have done, we must link arms across national boundaries while respecting uh, those individual differences. Uh, I'm for Scotland, uh, Scots who are for Scotland, uh, Brits who are for Britain, um, Americans who are for America and Italians. I, I, I love um, Georgia Maloney's you know, love of her own country. She's been something of a disappointment, but I do think that she loves her own country. Uh, Freedom International, you see as a kind of um, linking tool. It is a way of linking people up, populace, people who are against the uh, elitist mob, that this is a way of doing it. Tell us a little bit about Freedom International, Freedom Train well, International. 
Free, Freedom Train International was, was uh, as a founder, um, I decided that we needed to do something more than just talk because there was a lot of talking going on about 14, 15 months ago. When I got back onto social media, Larry, um, I had no idea where it was going to go. I mean, I just felt compelled. I mean, I really felt yeah, you've exploded. To get back on. You've exploded on social media. <laughs> Well, I have, but you know, it's a very, I tell you one thing, it's a very deeply humbling experience because, you know, to have gone from a fairly small channel of, of, of eight by 1800 people to over 200,000 now uh, is not lost on me. And um, I, I take that responsibility because it is a responsibility very, very highly. And, and I don't take it lightly. And, and who knows where it's going to go? You know, somebody said, well, what's your next target, Jim? I said, well, I don't really have targets. I'm not, it's not about numbers for me. I mean, I'm not ignorant of the fact that we've just gone over the 200,000 mark and that we're getting some very, very big uh, views and audiences. When you were behind that M134 uh, mini, electric minigun, I would say you had some targets that day, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, I think I might have done. Um, but you know something, um, no harm done. It was paper targets. We had a lot of fun. And I, I really, you know, I've grown up, I've grown up with firearms. I'm no stranger to them, but I don't get to play with the kind of toys you get to play with. And I was more, more than happy to, to be there. But in all seriousness, um, where do we go with this? Well, I, I, I speak to people all around the world. And I go to places. I mean, you, you know, I was across in the United States towards the end of last year. I was across eight different states. Yeah, I spent about three weeks there, uh, and I was on speaking, different speaking engagements on stage, talking to many, many different people. And uh, the same in Canada. I was only back in the UK for about a week or 10 days, and then I was off to Ottawa to meet up with people in the freedom movement in Canada. And what fantastic people they are. Uh, I mean, I met Chris Barber, Tamara Litch, I met Harold Juncker. I met um, Pastor Hildebrand. Uh, I met so many fantastic people, people that were at the very heart of the freedom movement in Canada. And indeed, when we launched the Freedom Train International, we did it on the anniversary of the freedom movement in Canada to pay tribute to them. So what I believe in, in and what I've experienced is that wherever you are, whether you're in the United States or Canada or Ireland or Holland or wherever, we are human beings at the end of the day. We, we, we all are very, very similar in many ways. We might speak a different language, we might have a different religion, or we might have a different culture or a different philosophy. But what's really important is that we are human beings. And we have a birthright. We have a birthright, which is all about freedom. We're not meant to live in cages. We're not meant to live under constant 24-hour surveillance or told to eat insects or be frightened and fearful. That's not what human spirit is all about. We need to be free. And wh wherever I go, whatever country I'm in, whatever, whatever people I speak to, it's the same message, the same desires, the same passions that I have encountered in so many people all around the world. And that's where I believe that Freedom Train International is the conduit to bring people together internationally. We're all about freedom, Larry. And, you know, when I, uh, when I reached out to you, all those months ago, because I was so impressed with what you were doing on your particular channel and the way you were presenting that information. I didn't expect to get a reply back from you. I was very, I was very surprised when I got an email back from you. And as you know, and people that have maybe watched us speak, speak, speak uh, together before, that then led to a phone call. That then led to you saying, hey, Jim, if you're coming to the United States, you know, come down and see me. And I did. And I've got to say, um, I was from North Dakota all the way down to Alabama. I loved it down with you guys. I, I've always been passionate about the South, uh, just as I'm passionate about the, the cooking that goes on in the Southern fried um, chicken and all the other great stuff that you have. And I, I was very fortunate to sample a lot of that when I was with you guys. But in all seriousness, this is about fighting for humanity, because one of the things that I'm very clear on, uh, when you really bore down into what globalism is, they're, they're against humanity. They want transhumanism. They want people to be chipped, implanted, to become something other than what it is to be human. And uh, I'm very, very concerned about the direction of travel uh, and what these people ultimately really want, because I think that ultimately they really want control. And that's going back to what you were just saying a little, little while ago about the levers of control. Ultimately, they cannot let, let people live in peace. 
They want to be their masters. And I think we're talking about with the World Economic Forum, and you and I have had this, this discussion before, uh, we are talking about a new type of feudalism where they are the lords and masters and we are the peasants and the serfs. And frankly, Larry, in my opinion, that's not going to work. I'd rather die on my feet fighting for freedom than living on my knees as a slave. Well said. And uh, going back to something you said about a minute ago, I couldn't agree with you more. I have taken to saying that um, we are, that I am pro-human. I am pro-human, pro-freedom, pro-human. Because having gone, as you know, um, the last two years to the World Economic Forum, I can tell you that these are people who are fundamentally haters of humanity. They are haters of freedom. They are haters of all that is good. And, um, and they see themselves as exempt from all the things that they would tell us to do. I mean, as you know, that uh, guys like John Kerry uh, fly around the country and the world, rather, in their private jets. I have no problem with private jets. If I had mega wealth, the one thing I would have is a private jet. But I wouldn't go around, I would not go around lecturing people on their carbon footprints. And this is what they do. They want to reduce the global population. How many of them have volunteered to step into a gas chamber? The answer to that would be zero. So they don't mean themselves. When they talk about carbon footprint, they don't mean their carbon footprint. They mean yours. They mean mine. When they talk about reducing the global population, they don't mean them. They mean you. They mean me. When they talk about reduced freedoms, they don't mean them. They mean you. They mean me. This, we talk about eating bugs. They're not going to eat bugs. They want us to eat bugs. This is the, they're not going to live in 15 minute cities. This is what they want. And these people, absolutely, they must be resisted by any and all means necessary because humanity is at stake. I mean, I don't know. I, I say this as a historian, Jim, I'm often telling people I, I get annoyed by hyperbole. You know, he was the greatest quarterback ever, you know, and I, I whenever I hear things like that about athletes, I'm always reminded of conversations, you know, with my father, you know, who would say, boy, uh, you know, um, Gail Sayers was awfully good, uh, or he'll refer to somebody who was in an era that I never saw, you know, I never saw them play, or he'll make reference to a baseball player that, that I, I didn't know. And, uh, and my own inclination is to say so-and-so is the best ever, but I'm really only limiting it to a, to a, 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 a small sliver in time. This is the worst storm ever. You know I mean? That ever is a very long time. But I'm going to use what sounds like hyperbole when I say that the globalist threat is the greatest threat to humanity ever. And it's because it isn't a localized threat. It's not just happening in Germany or, you know, in Spain or in some element of America or Africa. Their ambition is global and they are slowly gathering the reins of power of corporate, of the corporate world, governments globally, uh, UN, EU, NATO, on and on, so that they can weaponize all of these institutions against free peoples globally. So they do represent, in my view, the greatest threat to humanity in the history of civilization, and they must be resisted. And that means that people are listening to us. I wanted you to tell a little bit of your story because I want to answer the question that people at what can I do? Well, what did Jim Ferguson do? What did Larry Taunton do? What can you do locally? I'm telling people be annoying. Be annoying. I mean, that's one of the things that you can be is annoying. Uh, and to give some definition to that, I, I'm, I'm referring to the biblical story of the persistent widow who kept going to a corrupt judge who found her so annoying that he eventually gave her justice, not because he was a just judge, but simply because he wanted her off his back. We need, 
we need free peoples to be so annoying to their representatives, to their governments, that they do not let those people have rest until they give us the freedoms that we demand agriculturally, politically, socially. Um, we, we demand those things. We don't want your digital currencies. We don't want your open borders. We don't want our children sexualized. We do not want these evil things that you are trying to, we don't want your 15 minute cities. We don't want all of your electric uh, nonsense, uh, environmental nonsense. We don't, we don't want your mask mandates. We don't want your lockdowns. We don't want any of this stuff. Leave us alone. But in order to get there, we need people to engage. We need them to say, I am going to get involved. What do you say about that, Jim? Well, I mean, I absolutely 100% agree with you when you say that they are the biggest threat to humanity itself that we have ever seen because of their power, their wealth, and I dare say it, technology as well. And sometimes people say to me, Jim, why is it now they're talking about this? What, 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 what's the purpose of it now? Well, I think a lot of it is to do with AI. It's to do with the fact that they have scientific breakthroughs, uh, robotics. All, all of these things are playing a factor. They can drive trains, buses, planes, drones without any kind of human interaction now. And I don't believe it will be too far into the future before we will see um, you know, uh, war machines that are that are fully autonomous on the battlefield, and and that is they're they're that already have. they're already there, um, and are, and I yeah. think this, Jim, if I may if I may add this, mm. I don't think they're really being developed so much for use, and not to say they won't be used in foreign battles in places like Ukraine. I think they're devel being developed chiefly to be used against domestic populations. Yeah, absolutely, I believe that is the case. But we must fight for what we believe in because there is nothing to be, there is no life to be had by living as a slave or a serf to some World Economic Forum cultist who thinks that they are better than you or I. Uh, we, we cannot tolerate that and, and, and our freedoms are fundamentally important. So I absolutely 100% agree with you. When people stand up, when one man stands up, 10 others find their backbone. I can't remember, Larry, who said that or who quoted that originally. But it's a very true saying. When we start to stand up and fight for what we want, whether it's our countries or our people or our communities, or even just our families, that's when other people around you suddenly see that strength and they will gravitate towards that. And depending on how you do it, I've always, always been professional in everything I do, whether in business or whether just in ordinary inter interactions with other people, always being cool, calm and measured. And that's fundamentally important. Uh, how we choose to use our language, the kind of eloquent speeches that we give or, or make or the way that we describe what's actually going on is incredibly important to instill confidence and give hope to other people around the world. But for people that say, what can we do? I would say to you, join Freedom Train International for one thing, because very soon we're going to start giving very, very detailed information about what you need to know, about what you need to do, about the things that are coming. And we're going to do that with our members because if we go completely fully public facing, we will be attacked by globalists. There is no doubt about it. They will use misinformation, disinformation, you know, type legislation against us. We've seen Bill C-63 in Canada being coming into place with the, the Trudeau administration. We've seen hate law speeches being introduced into Ireland. We've seen similar hate law speeches coming into the UK, the enactment of Article 21 in France, and on and on and on it goes. So we've got to understand that what we are doing now in six months or in 18 months, we may not be able to do publicly because they might they might just decide to attack. And there's one thing, Larry, that, that is very clear to me and has been clear for quite some time. And, and it's important because you were at the Davos meeting, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment. But one thing that's crystal clear to me, they are losing the information war. And that's why, despite their infiltration of mainstream media, the buy-offs and, the, and the, the, the advertising budgets that they give to all these mainstream newspapers, to buy their compliance and their silence. Despite all of that, 
people are still waking up. They talk about a great reset. I believe there is a great awakening taking place. And I believe that it's not just happening in one or two countries, it's happening around the world. People must wake up and realize that the power exists within them. And that's what terrifies the globalists so much. Because there's a lot more of us than there is of them, certainly at the moment, unless they try to accelerate their depopulation agenda. And who knows? Who knows where that's going to go? But let's put it this way, Larry. We have got everything to fight for. And when our backs are against the wall, we will fight. And we will do whatever it takes to ensure that freedom and humanity prevails. And I do believe that there is higher powers in play. There is no doubt about it in my mind. And I expect that he, as in the Lord above, expects people like you and me to fight the good fight. Whether we win or whether we lose, ultimately he wins. And if we've been on the right side of history, on the right side of truth, then that's really all that matters. There's always casualties in a war, Larry. And I believe we are at war with globalists. There is no doubt about that in my mind. They have declared war on humanity, on our freedoms, on our beliefs, on our very way of life. And our families and our loved ones are under threat. And we need to stand up. We need to get ready and prepared. And Freedom Train International is serious about what we're doing with everybody around the world. We don't care what country you're from, what religion you are, what faith system you belong to. If you're a human being, you believe in freedom, honesty, and you are lawful and abiding, then we are on your side, wherever you are in the world. Jim, um, first, how do people join Freedom Train International? Why don't you give that information? Somebody out there listening, they want to join. Where do they do it? How do they do it? Okay, so Freedom Train International only got launched at the end of January. And we wanted to sort of throw the doors open, let people come in and get, get used to what we were about. We've had contributors writing articles and all sorts of things like, things like that. But um, very soon, within just a matter of weeks, it's going to be going to member-only content. So they can reach us on freedomtraininternational.org. And of course, uh, I'm on X, uh, I'm, and Freedom Train International is also now on YouTube as well. We've created a channel really literally within the last few days. It's already got hundreds of members joining us there as well. So it is something that is about to spread. We're looking at, at other, other mediums as well, but we have to be careful. Uh, Facebook's not a good medium to be on. They're very censored and they don't like free speech. So we have to be careful about where we're going with all of that. But if you join Freedom Train International and become a member, you're going to be getting a lot of information. And um, that's going to give you hope. And it's going to give a community, an online community, where people can reach out, ask questions. There's going to be bulletin boards. There's going to be online discussions. There's going to be conferences, international conferences, with thousands of people engaged in that for our members. So if you're worried about something, if, you're, if you've got concerns, you want to, to ask a doctor, for instance, a question, there's doctors that are with us. There are solicitors who have joined us. There are veterans, military veterans who have joined us. There are all sorts of people, authors and researchers. We have a, a talent pool that is second to none. And really, to be honest with you, all the credit for this goes to all the people who have helped to share this content, who have helped to promote it, and who have gone out of their way even to buy me the occasional coffee. And I'm very grateful for people that do that because everything that somebody does, whether it's the smallest gesture, to some of the grand gestures which people have made towards Freedom Train, and to me personally, nevertheless, we all play a part. And as you said about the story of the widow uh, being annoying and keep on going, perseverance, perseverance, we must never give up. Uh, we just get back up and we keep on going no matter what we have put in front of us, whatever obstacles they put in front of us, we never stop, we keep on going. And some of the best business people I've ever come across, some of them have, have uh, maybe earlier on in their lives, they've maybe failed, or, but they, they didn't stay down. They got back up and they then really made it big. And that's what we've got to be like. We've got to keep on going and keep on moving and believing in each other and supporting each other wherever we are in the world. And of course, we've got natural alliances. I mean, the United States and the United Kingdom have always been traditional allies anyway. I mean, so many people... Um, went from the highlands of Scotland to the United States of America, you know. 
so wherever, wherever I go, I always find somebody who's got some kind of Scottish roots or Irish roots. And of course, we, we share that common bond. And um, as you know, I have a huge, huge respect for the people in the United States of America. I love you guys. And um, I was very privileged to meet so many of you when I was over there. But it's about unity. Coming together, Larry, in my opinion, is what will defeat those globalists and their evil intent. And let's face it, they've got nothing good. They're, they're not doing anything good for, for humanity, in my opinion. And I think you probably would agree with that. As you know, I'm descended from the Henderson clan on my mother's side. So uh, definitely have a strong connection with Scotland there. Yesterday, Jim, I had a speaking engagement and someone asked me this question and I'm, I'm going to put it to you. I'm curious to see, uh, hear your response to this. And you, you might have just kind of answered it there at the, at the end. But someone asked me, do you think that the globalists, you know, the kind of people that are at the WEF, do you think, Larry, that these are people who are evil and know that they're evil? Or do you think that they're people who really believe that they're good? What do you think? Well, I, I think, I mean, you went to the World Economic Forum. I, I said to you, hey, Larry, you, you make sure you've got your, your security precautions in place. And, yes. and if there's a problem, you, you let me know and I'll be over with half a dozen Scottish Highlanders to, be, to, to <laughs> rescue you. Uh, and I was, I was actually quite serious. But at the same time, um, I think that a lot of people that are involved with the World Economic Forum, it's like a club to them. They, they want to be in with the cool guys, the cool, the, you know, the cool, like the popular guys in school or the popular girls in school. You know, they want to be part of something that they think is going to help them to make more money or achieve greater prosperity. And I can understand why people would join these types of associations. Now, I don't think every single member of the World Economic Forum is evil or uh, a Satan worshipping black robed uh, type I agree of, with of that. activity that's going on, right? Just but naive. I do think. Very naive, very naive. But I think that as you go higher up the pyramid, yeah, I think there is some very deeply sinister, very vile, very, very wicked elements to all of that. And uh, you, do you know think they, they will... Do you think they know they're evil? Do you think they, they, they really, that Justin Trudeau deep down and Klaus Schwab and, uh, you know, the, the Bill Gates types... Do you think they know they're evil or that they kind of say to themselves, I'm, I'm a very good human being and what I'm doing is for the good of humanity? Well, self-delusion exists. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, met, I've met people in business who, who I suspected of being psychopathic in nature uh, mm -hmm. just simply because of the way they, they go around. They're, they're very narcissistic. Uh, but I, you can see the signs. And I think I'll, sometimes you will get people that gravitate to uh, enforcement type activities. I've met a few in my time uh, who are gravitate towards that, that sort of authority type uh, occupations where they have power over other people because they enjoy having power over other people for power's sake. Not because they want to do good necessarily, but because they just like to have power. I've come across a number of people like that in my lifetime, uh, but they usually tend to get found out. They tend to make a mistake. They're normally very intelligent. But I think in relation to the World Economic Forum, they're only but one of the global institutions, the globalists that, that are there. Uh, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the, the, the World Health Authority, the Bilderbergers, uh, the Trilateral Commission, the Council of 300. I mean, the list is extensive. Uh, and I think it, the further up you go, the, the more corrupt it actually is. There will be people who think they buy into that sort of very dubious mindset that they're they're saving the world by by being a globalist. Um, but there are also others who actually serve darkness. They serve their lord of darkness. I, I think that there are people who are actually quite religious, but it's a dark religion. It's not it's not God inspired. It's, it's I agree with that. the opposite. Uh, and they exist. I, I, they exist I agree with that. I, uh, you talk about having some Scottish Islanders um, with me, which is, you know, always welcome, uh, particularly some of the places I've been recently. You know, I was down um, towards the Darien Gap um, in, uh, on both sides. I was on the Colombian side, on the, the, the in cartel country, and then on the, the, uh, the northern side uh, in uh, Panama. 
And uh, these are some very sketchy, dangerous places. But then I was in Mexico City, which, you know, it, the the city center of Mexico City is just delightful. It's beautiful, wonderful restaurants, beautiful people, terrific weather uh, because it's, you know, has some elevation. And uh, so it's uh, quite cool. It's nice. Um, but Lori had joined me in Mexico City and we'd gone out for dinner. We were walking back to the hotel and... Um, from a terrace above me, water was splashed on me. Never, didn't see where it came from. For all I know, it came out of a condensation tube. Didn't hit Lori, it just hit me. But within a couple of hours, I was violently ill. I was violently ill. I was retching. I was throwing up um, all night long. And this went on. I, even now, almost a week later, I'm still not quite better. And, um, you know, it. It, Lori was the one who said, you know, because we both ate the same thing. We had a, a shared meal. It was, we'd eaten at this restaurant where they kind of put the food in the middle and we were both eating exactly the same thing and she didn't get sick. So we, we knew it wasn't food poisoning. And she said that, that whole water thing was so suspicious. She said, it just, just hit you. And it seemed to come from out of nowhere. And there were other people who were walking near us who at the same time were looking up like, what in the world? What just happened there? Perhaps no connection whatsoever. But the point is, uh, what you say is very real. Um, I mean, we just had a whistleblower at Boeing who was on his way to do interviews that suddenly he supposedly kills himself. And um, the whole Jeffrey Epstein thing, I, I don't consider myself to be a so-called conspiracy theorist. Cameras just conveniently aren't working at the moment yeah. that he supposedly commits suicide. That, that's not happening. That's, and the, no guards were there at, at, at that moment. Um, he didn't kill himself. So we are dealing with people who be them sociopathic, psychopathic, whatever they are. Anybody who has no problem doing the kinds of things that they're doing to children, who really thinks that reducing the global population by six to seven billion people is a moral good, who celebrates the annihilation of the unborn, would certainly have no problem bumping off a guy like you or me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, what, what we're doing doesn't come without risk. Um, which is why I take the precautions that I take. But at the same time, uh, you know, you, you know, we, we see what happens to people sometimes that that start to to get too close. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, my opinion, Larry, is that uh, you know this life is is for living. Uh, it's not to be lived in fear. This life is for enjoying. It's to be for being with our families. It's for for being with our communities and our loved ones. It's for living our lives. And, you know, maybe we were born for a moment such as this. Uh, and I'll tell you something, Larry, I don't know about you, but I've never been afraid of death. I remember being on a plane to Australia a, a long time ago now, and uh, we hit some very, very serious turbulence. And uh, I, I was sitting beside my, my companion heading over there, and I turned around to her and I said, oh, this is pretty rough, isn't it? I hope the wings don't fall off, you know? And there were some people that are starting to, you know, heard what I said, and they're starting to get rather nervous. I thought it was quite funny in a dark kind of way, but um, <laughs> I was, I had a, yeah, I was a bit of a mischievous younger guy, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but at the same time, I thought to myself, if we go down, we go down. I'm not bothered about it. And right now, couldn't care less. If, if I go down, I go down. All I want, if I ever end up, and I will most certainly end up, being judged like everybody else. I just want to be able to say, look back and say, well, I made the effort. Because I think we'll all be asked, what did you do? Did you try to wake people up? What did you do? What good did you do? Not that that in itself, good works were not going to save us. But I think at least if we've tried, then uh, we're on the right track. And I think we must no, I get do whatever your point. we can for, for humanity. There's only one person that can save us, only one act that can save us before anybody it's on to me. And I, I, you know, as a Christian, I have absolutely no, no qualms about that. Jesus Christ is the only one that's going to save us at the end of the day. Uh, but I do believe that we must do what's right. We can't just sit back. As you said 
earlier on, when good men do nothing, evil triumphs. Um, maybe paraphrasing slightly, but you know what I mean. And I think at the end of the day, it's up to every one of us, regardless of where we are in this life, regardless of what position we have, we all have a duty to do what's right and to support our leaders that are trying their best to, 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 to get to where we need to go and support those, those in government, provided they're doing the right things. And I mean, in, in the United States, you've got some good senators over there. Uh, we've got one or two good politicians in our parliament as well. They're few and far between, unfortunately. But we should support everybody that's in this fight. Um, and I think Freedom Train International, just to, to sort of broaden it out, is, is there in this fight with people as well. We're not going to leave people alone. We're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on communications all around the world going. We're even putting in, in uh, the ability to pay for people that don't speak English to, to understand what we're talking about. But I'm very lucky because I've got German and French uh, speaking contributors who are doing an amazing job, um, really are. You know, they're, they're, they're fantastic people. So I'm very lucky, I'm very, very blessed in many ways to have such people around me. And I include you in that regard as well, Larry. We've become friends. It's an I don't honor, say Jim. that lightly. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't say it lightly. You know, I, 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 I guess with our first phone call, I thought, well, here's somebody I kind of like, you know, and I liked your broadcast. But when you actually meet somebody in person, of course, as we did when I was down in Alabama with you and your family, uh, that's when it really all clicked together for me. And, and that's when you realize uh, that you've actually got somebody that's, a, I was going to say a soulmate. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but, you know, it's somebody that, that, that is like you, somebody that believes in the same values, somebody that has the same kind of, mission in life that's what i really mean by that and that's that's where you and Listen, i got connected I, i'll i'll accept soulmate that doesn't mean we're gay we can uh, no it does we not can, uh, <laughs> just, to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify that yeah absolutely it doesn't apply it doesn't apply any any kind of romantic i bet you come off this you you're gonna come off i say i i used to like that jim fergus until he said that <laughs> Maybe we I, need you know, to edit Jim, that out. Jim, Jim, <laughs> Jimmy, having spent some time with you here, I'm quite convinced you're heterosexual. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is, uh, you know, as for be fearing death, I'm with Hugh Glass. I'll, I'll quote him. Hugh Glass, who was the subject of that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio um, film, The Revenant. It, oh, yeah. Hugh Glass said, I'm not afraid of death. I've already done it. And, um, I, I, in some sense, I've already done it. Having been um, revived, it's given me a very different perspective on life, and I don't hold on to it so closely because I know it is in the next life um, that um, that I shall enjoy an eternal Sabbath. And I, something you said there um, about Jesus Christ being our only hope and yet our own responsibilities to engage, it was Jesus himself who told the story of the servant who was away and who comes back and finds those servants uh, who are doing nothing and punishes them. I mean, he, he yes, he is our only hope, but he, he wants to work through us. He wants to work. He doesn't need Jim Ferguson. He doesn't need Larry Taunton, but he wants to use us to redeem his creation. And I'm all on board with that. And uh, I totally agree with you, Jim. Uh, I said very recently uh, in an interview, or perhaps it was a podcast we were doing that, you know, I want my, my tombstone to say that he, he, he gave everything that he had mm. um, to use a sporting expression. He left it all on the field, uh, positively, negatively flawed man, though he was, he did everything he could, and that's because I care about my children, my grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I, I don't want to have that mentality that says, well, you know what, you know, we'll let them fend for themselves. I want to leave them the world that was left for me. I want them to have the same freedoms that I enjoyed. And that means standing up to wickedness and to standing a, a for the voiceless, the powerless, the poor, those yeah. people who cannot defend themselves. That, that's, that is a major part of what it means to be a Christian. Well, I very much I could concur with that. And, you know, one of the things when you said earlier on, you know, what, what is it that really motivates you? Well, I've always 
I've always fought for the underdog, you know. When I was in school, uh, if I saw somebody getting picked on, I'd go in there. And sometimes I got a, I got a hammering from some of the older guys, you know. It doesn't matter. You get stuck in and, and you learn to fight. And sometimes, you, you, you know, you learn to, to hit back against bigger opponents. And I did. Uh, and, and sometimes got into trouble for it. But at the same time, uh, those kids that, that you defended, those, those youngsters that you, you stood up to, uh, respected you. And, and they didn't pick on you again. You know, you've got to stand up to bullies. Uh, I'm sure we've all been bullied at some point in school. I know I was, uh, until I fought back. And my God, they, you know, by God, they, they, they stopped it pretty quick because I suddenly realized that uh, once you lose the fear, once you lose the fear, you become unstoppable. And uh, I have no fear. I have no fear of death. And I will keep on going and doing everything I can for humanity's sake. But it's not all about me. It's about everybody in this world who loves their countries, who loves their families, who loves their communities and their freedoms. And that, to me, is worth fighting for. And I'm sure, um, you know, a lot of people will feel the same way as, as you and I do. And I know that um, certainly uh, people that are going to be watching this will hopefully gain some, some understanding that, that what, what motivates us, what drives us forward. And I think it's all about... Um, doing the right thing. Um, we don't always get it right, you know. I make mistakes, you've made mistakes. We've all we've all got it wrong from time to time. But you learn from your mistakes. At least if you, you get back up on your feet and you don't let the knockdowns keep you down, you've got to get, bounce it back up and you've got to keep on going again. And we all get knocked down in one way or another from time to time. But uh, we can't afford to live our lives in fear any longer. It's time to stand up, time to get united and to, to fight back. Uh, for humanity's sake and for fighting the good fight, as they say, Larry. Jim, it is always a pleasure to have you on. I look forward to hosting you again here. I, uh, I'm very flattered to accept your man crush. Uh, it's just wonderful to have <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful to have you have you on the show, Jim. Listen, uh, best uh, to you and to your family. Let's connect um, again soon. Uh, by phone and uh, do a little yeah. strategizing. Yeah, I very much look forward to it, Larry. And um, I, I mean, I'm watching the United States closely. I'm watching the election of Donald Trump, hopefully going to come in to, to it very soon. But who knows? I might get back over there. And if I do, I'll absolutely come down. Please give my You're best welcome. regards to Laurie. Tell, tell Laurie and, and the family I'm very much asking after them all. And uh, look forward to seeing you again at some point. And yes, let's, let's have a chat soon sometime. All right, listen, take care, brother. This has been another episode of Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.